little bit, I want you, not a pol impolite golf applause, but I'd like you to applaud for yourself for coming out on a frigid night to learn about a topic you'd probably rather not hear about. <laughs> so if you could just applaud for yourself to get warmed up a little bit. And, uh, I have to tell you, Adam is a um, colleague of mine who I've known for a few years, and it was my pleasure to be here before the holiday break and observe what was going on, and I was very impressed with what I saw going on here, and I have absolutely nothing to gain from this young man over here, so I'm saying it now for him because he's too humble, and he won't talk about the good job that he's done here. But I notice it as a professor of education, as a mental health specialist, I notice what's going on here. So I would like you to signal to Adam, thanks for putting together a program <laughs> again that would be at this school, you know, difficult for anybody to do, but particularly difficult when a community demands excellence. So can you just applaud for Adam? <laughs> the two programs I saw were very good. Now this is my buddy over here. This is Officer Don. How many of you have ever heard of something called Safety Town? Safety Town. Raise your hand. Officer Don used to run something called Safety Town. He used to, years. These little kids about this high. And Officer Don makes fun of me because I'm older than him. I'm like his older brother. And so we were at a parent presentation at Olin Tangy Schools. And this young man came up to me. He's about, I don't know, 30 introduced himself, hey, I'm one of the faculty here. I heard you talk about Safety Town. I want to tell you, Officer Don was in charge of that when I was there. I thought he meant his kid. No, he meant him. <laughs> I said, Officer Don, come over here, meet him. So that was one of the pleasures of my day. So he works with kids this big. Anybody ever hear something called Dare Officer? Dare Officer. He was one of those, right? One of those. So he's worked with kids in the middle schools and high schools. Anybody ever hear of the Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force? <laughs> it's trained by the Internet Crimes Against Children's Task Force. In a sense, they pooled all the talent and money together in Central Ohio and trained and cross-trained departments. He's tip of the spear with keeping the Internet safe for kids and for adults. Let me reintroduce him because this is how I reintroduce him to kid, your kid's age and elementary school kids. It's 12-year-old Judy. It's 12-year-old Judy. So I asked him, why would I call him 12-year-old Judy? Why do you think I called him 12-year-old Judy? When he goes online, that's who he is. And he's pretty good at it. So we say to the kids, why does he pretend to be a 12-year-old girl when he goes online? Some of them say, to catch us? And Don says quickly, no not to catch us, not to catch you. I'm making sure that's safe. That's the take home we want to share because in the world we have, all of your kids know when Officer Don trained them in Safety Town, something about stranger danger, right? These kids know not to talk to strangers. I'd never do that. I'd never wait, give away information online to somebody who I don't know. But I ask them, how many of you do online gaming? How many hands go up in the air? Almost all of them, and I say, how many of you have chatted with somebody online who you've never met face to face? And all the hands go up. And I said, how do you know that's 12-year-old Judy and not the 57-year-old creepy dude from Las Vegas? Right? So I want to spit in their soup a little bit. I want to get them to think before they do that. Don's message is quite simple. We've been doing a bit of work in two neighboring districts that are going to one-to-one -one programs where they hand the kids devices instead of textbooks. And so they've immersed us in there. So we embrace technology, we love technology, we're not anti-technology at all. And we walk that line because we know the strongest prevention measure is to talk to kids about where that line is and what to do if they cross that line. Okay. That's the expertise he'll share tonight, the legal end. Mine is the mental health and education end of it. So I ask kids, are there some things you can do online to make your life easier? And I don't mean like Google Map that teaches us. We, we go three places, the next two days, we go to two places I've never seen before. And we get face-to-face -face turning directions to get there. So we love technology to get there. Some little person tells me that. 
Do you know how many what? middle schools, high schools, and elementary schools are all named the same? <laughs> yeah, we what? might be going to Toledo or Youngstown, and we'll bring up the name of the middle school, and it's like you have to choose from a drop down of like 30 different middle schools <laughs> with that same name. It's, we almost went to the wrong place once. I know. They, they give us the look when we go in there and we're a little bit like, said, look, Adam gave me. He's like, are you ready? Are you ready? Like, it gives me that principal look. All right. <laughs> So my thing I'm going to talk about is what can you do to make your life easier when you're online? Second piece is most, and I'm going to share some startling statistics with you. Most parents talk to kids about social media use. They do. They just don't tell them the right things. There are two things they leave out that are the most impactful. I'll share those two things with you. There are five things that most parents do. I'll share those five things with you. I'll share the two things that are most impactful. And we're going to do it before 8.30 p.m. Yeah. Officer Don, yes, we are. <laughs> Good luck with that. All right. Okay. <laughs> then we're going to talk about some common things we see kids doing. And then we're going to show you the two things that we think we're most concerned about. They're live casting and camouflage apps. And we'll talk about those two things. Make sense? Does that make sense back there? That's I don't want to put you to sleep, man. All right. Okay. Here we go. For you guys. Okay. All right. Right. Thank you. Do they know who you are, right? Oh, I'm Tim Conrad. Yeah, I'm a professor, counselor, coach. Pretty boring guy. I like to hear about other people's stuff, not my own stuff. So, yeah. I was so I disappointed say. that you didn't have one of those jackets with a little tweed uh, <laughs> and a pipe. Yeah. Yeah. Stick my pipe in my belt when I talk and stuff. I have it. It's on the chair. Right? Yeah. I just left it on the chair. Yeah. 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 Just in your bag. It's a, yeah. So this is our loose agenda and we say it's a loose agenda because a lot of times you guys will hijack what we talk about and that's by design yeah uh, we want you to bring up things that you're curious or concerned about because what we put together may not you know really hit the spot for you or it may or we may go into detail far beyond what you had expected so if there's something that we aren't covering or it's affiliated with what we're talking about, bring it up and we'll be happy to kind of dive right in. Um, now, the big question is, is where do we go in this digital world? And when we call it a world, that's what it is. The digital world is very much like this world. Your kids are the first generation to be in this dual world society. They live here in this physical world where they're living and they're breathing. Think about it as living in first person. You know, you can touch, you can feel, smell, taste, touch, it is all there. Over here though, you have the digital world. And it is a third person learning experience and living experience. Think of it as akin to reading a story about somebody. And that's how they experience things. Unfortunately, how we experience things in the physical world is a lot different than the digital world. How we interact with each other in the physical world is a lot different than the digital world. We have several questions we ask kids. We do an, an informal poll as we do our presentation and we ask them specific things. One of the questions we ask them is, how many of you know somebody that in the physical world they act one way and in the digital world they act totally different? Almost every hand goes up. That's almost an expectation. Uh, the digital world has this this reputation of, well, bad things are going to happen there, and that's just the cost of, of the internet. Can I, can I just interject yeah. one thing? We amplify that part by saying this, and they get it. As an adult, I didn't get it until 41,000 students later, after last year, I got it. They now expect that the digital them is the real them. Did you know that? In the face-to-face, is the posturing person. Watch in the media and look for when people transgress on social media, the response is almost, ah, oh, that's the real person. That wasn't the fake person there. So with kids, we teach them, be really careful the reputation you have online because people think that your online reputation is the real you, <coughs> not the diversion. And the face-to-face -face you is the posturing you. <coughs> That can work to a kid's advantage if, if you teach them to post positive, right? Absolutely. It can work to a disadvantage 
if they're posting stuff to make a 12 year old giggle and then somebody sees that post two years from now. And that's the message we try to bring to them, is the digital you is the real you. How do you want to be perceived? We have several activities we do with them. Yeah. So you know, the big question is always, well, why does that happen? Why do people act this way in the physical world and this way in the digital world? And we aren't going to go into a, a lot of that. Um, Tim and I wrote a book and we discussed it in pretty good detail there. But there's a couple of key factors. Um, leaving um, you know, their impulsive nature aside, uh, you have some things that are, are functioning under the radar. One thing is that in the physical world, you have immediate consequences to actions usually. But in the digital world, you have a delayed consequence. Uh, it is not uncommon for us to be you know, serving a search warrant on a home for an action someone did three weeks ago. So they did something on the internet three weeks ago, we're just now dealing with it today. Now in a child's um, world, it looks a little more like this. They say something through text message or on Instagram to one of their friends. And their friend is hurt or offended, but they don't say anything. They just kind of let it pass because they don't know how to how to respond to it, and a lot of times they don't want to make big waves. So that student ended up offending their friend or an associate, and they had no idea they even did it. And you know as well as I do, the only way you learn how to interact socially is if people give you feedback, like, hey, that didn't feel good, you know, you hurt my feelings, or that was really rude or insensitive. And then that's how we, we change or adjust the way we interact with people. And that doesn't exist in the digital world very often. You know, not to mention, when you raise your children, in the physical world, you teach them some basic safety rules. What are some safety rules you teach your kids? What do you tell them never to do? Look both ways across the street. Yeah, look both ways before you cross the street. Don't just bolt in there. That's good. Anything else? Don't talk to strangers, that's a good one. Don't play with fire, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know. Um, so there are some instructions that we give them in the, in the physical world, but in the digital world, sometimes they have a hard time applying those rules or those, those safety uh, lessons. In addition to that, you know what happens? In the physical world, they can be completely creeped out by a stranger. But in the digital world, there's a disconnect in their amygdala. And that's part of their brain that senses danger. And one of the jobs of the amygdala is to say, hey, wait, that's dangerous. I don't think we should go there or do that or be near that person. In the physical world, it works great. I'll give you an example of this. Um, you know, I taught Safety Town for 12 years, and we teach you know, kids five and six years old, about stranger danger, you know? Stranger someone, come on, your kids know this. A stranger somebody, you don't know. You don't know, very good, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's something that a lot of people remember for their whole life. Well, it's funny because, you know, I'll be going around somewhere and I'll have a kid run up and say, officer, officer, guess what? I'm like, what? Stranger someone you don't know. Which that was their way of interacting. I mean, that was what they had. They wanted to say hi, but they didn't know how to do it. Now they're, they're not a teacher now, but yeah. <laughs> but you know, they'll they'll run up and, and say silly little things just to interact with them. Well, I was in Giant Eagle, and I was getting some groceries, and I had um, you know someone run up and they go, "Officer, oh, guess what?" I'm like, "What?" He goes, "I was over there at Frozen Foods, and this guy came up to me. And he was a stranger." Hey, calm down. I said, what happened? He goes, well, he said hi to me. I said, then what happened? And he goes, well, I ran over here and told you because you're Officer Don and he's a stranger. <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay, calm down. You did the right thing. You, were, you did everything perfectly. You're 18 years old, but good for you, you know? <laughs> he remembered that when he was 18 years old. I was curious because, you know, he's six foot two, you know, about 180 pounds. I mean, no one's going to kidnap him. You know, he played football, and I thought, well, he's 
definitely afraid of strangers in the physical world. What does the digital world look like to him? So I went online and I checked out his Facebook page because at the time that's what everyone was using. using. Um, and I noticed that he had over 1,200 friends on Facebook. So obviously the stranger thing wasn't being applied in the digital world. So I had a talk with mom and dad and we decided to just bring him in and we all sit down and talk as a group. And I asked him, I said, you know, you have 1,200 friends on Facebook. He goes, yes, I do. He's very proud of that. It made him see as popular. I said, how many of them do you know? I know all of them. You know, I read their Facebook pages. I said, how many of them are your friends? He goes, well, they all friended me, so I guess we're friends, right? I said, how many of them have you ever met before? He goes, like in the real world? Well, yeah. I don't know. So we went through the list. And did you know that we got rid of over 800, we, we got rid of 800 friends and then some. We got them down to 400 friends, okay? So we trimmed over 800 friends off of this friends list. Now I did want to make it 399, but the one girl was too hot to get rid of, so <laughs> he, he insisted on keeping her. Although I do, do wonder who that person really was because I don't think it was who she said she was. Judy. Yeah, the girl, girl Judy. <laughs> Um, but the fact is, is that in a digital world, he was kind of cavalier about who he would talk to. In the physical world, he's very cautious of it. And we see that very much with even the elementary kids we talk to. We're, um, we're surprised by this. We, we try to let kids understand they need to use their privacy setting, which is a good parenting tip, is to have kids use their privacy setting. They don't understand that anybody they let inside their privacy settings can cause all kinds of mayhem. So if I friend somebody or follow somebody or on Instagram, let them inside my privacy settings, they now have access to all my content and can expose that content to people beyond my intended audience. And Don's right. Do we have some knuckleheads who we've let inside our privacy setting, who we friended, who might not be who we wanted to be? Yeah. And also we have our own friends who really aren't our friends, who will expose content that are intended for their peers and expose it to the school or expose it to other people as a way of harming us. And that's a very real thing that happens in every school that we visit. And we'd yeah. rather kids not have to deal with that. Yeah. So we look at the places all of us generally go. Now, some of these are weighted more towards the kids, but I think you guys will be all aware of where these websites are and what they do. But we'll kind of go over them one at a time. How many of you are aware of what Facebook is? Don, that's the biggest thing that four years ago, you'd ask the kids, they would say they were on Facebook. Now when we ask them, we have to say how many people's parents are on Facebook. <laughs> and that's what goes up to you. That's a huge shift. You know why that is? Y'all chase them off of Facebook. Because <laughs> they know you're watching. And they'll only post things they want you to see. The other stuff they'll post on other platforms. Yeah, you know, and Facebook is really what you did last weekend. You know, everyone posts photographs and whatnot. And uh, it's, think of this as a coffee shop. This is not where kids generally hang out. This is where grown-ups hang out, you know, and do their thing. So Facebook is like a little neighborhood. It's like a, a hangout place. Um, that's really all it is. And a lot of adults use it. Some kids use it. In fact, a lot of kids use it just to keep in touch with aunts and uncles and things like that. Um, Twitter. Anybody not know what Twitter is? It's pretty, um, pretty popular. It's uh, it's catching up with Facebook, and uh, it is very common. There is uh, a Chinese version of this called Weibo, and it's even bigger than Twitter, mainly because their population is much bigger than ours. Um, but Weibo works just like Twitter. You say things in 140 characters, and it is what you are doing right now, generally. And it's not uncommon for us to go to a burglary and start processing the scene and then have the homeowners come home. And we'd ask them, well, you know, where were you? Well, I was over at the horseshoe at, at the game. Oh. Did you, you know, take any pictures there? Well, yeah, yeah, we took pictures. Did you upload them anywhere? Well, yeah, I put them on my Twitter account. You know? And 
you know, and lo and behold, their Twitter page is open for everyone to see, so everyone knew exactly where they would be and how long they would be there because they know how long a game lasts. A big, a, a big awareness of mine from hanging around with these law enforcement guys for three years is that not only are good guys on Twitter, but bad guys are on Twitter. And the crazy thing is they'll post evidence of their crime on Twitter. And it's made their jobs <laughs> easier to follow. And it's that crumb trail and the exponential factor of the internet is huge. But I guess what I don't get is why they continue to post evidence of their crime online. You know why. Yeah, because if nobody saw it, it didn't happen. So they'd rather risk getting caught than um, having nobody see that they committed that crime. It's crazy, but it's made law enforcement's job easier the internet. All that crumb trap. You'll see high school students using this a lot. They get introduced to it in middle school. In fact, a lot of schools use this as a tool. You know, talking about uh, snow days, um, talking about what's going on during football practice or, you know, um, you know cross country. Uh, it is a good way of communicating. This is a really good tool if used pro appropriately. Um, I mean, it's just like any tool that you have in the garage. If you use it improperly, it can hurt people. Uh, this is no different. Uh, this one's very powerful. It's the one tool that we can think of is responsible for the downfall of actual governments in this world. I mean, Tunis, uh, Tunisia, there was an uprising, and it all started on Twitter, and Tunisia fell, and a new government came up. Egypt, same thing happened. So, you know, there's a lot of power that comes with this tool, and hopefully people are making the right decisions with it. Now, this is the one the kids are using the most. It's uh, Instagram, and it's all about taking pictures. Telling your story through pictures. Now, let's talk for a moment about pictures. How many of you have ever heard someone say, it is not safe to put a picture of, of a child on the internet? How many of you in your gut kind of feel like there's something to that? Yeah, we all do, don't we? Did you know back in the 1990s, it was actually the worst thing in the world to put a child's name on the internet? How many of you think that's dangerous? having their name floating around. Do you ever wonder if there's any legitimate, real concern about having a name, having a, a picture on the internet? Is it possible that a predator could see that and target your child? Absolutely. But statistics don't show that. You know, there's a risk of, of being kidnapped every time you leave your home. The question is, is it such a concern that we don't allow them to post photographs on their Instagram account? That's the big question. And that's a parent question. That's something we can't tell you. You have to decide for yourself. What I can tell you is it is very rare for someone to target someone just from a photograph they find on the internet. And usually when they do, it's not that it's a photograph of a child on the internet. It's what that photograph is showing what that person is doing on that photograph. And it's usually something inappropriate, you know, illicit drug use, um, something with high sexual content, um, something to that effect. Because we all know, how many of you have pictures of your kids on your Facebook page? Yeah. Okay. Nothing bad happens there. How many schools post kids' pictures online? Every single school does. As long as you sign that waiver that says they're allowed to do it, they do it. They post on Twitter and show everyone you know, what they're doing in the classroom. It's great PR. Just posting pictures online isn't necessarily the kiss of death. It's not necessarily going to be dangerous to your child. What is dangerous are some of the photographs some students choose to take that are inappropriate. We do a little exercise with kids where we bring them up and we ask them to pretend that they're talking to a younger student. And the younger student is saying, is this okay to post on Instagram? Is this okay to post on Instagram? And some things that are over the line for us is posting an image of yourself on Instagram that has your school gear on. Because that says, that's where I am every day from 10 to 2 if you want to come visit me. Um, we ask them to look at a picture 
that shows their address in the background, and that's not a good idea, like in front of their house. We ask them, um, a picture of you out in the field playing with your dog, is that okay? Well, of course it is. Your favorite flower, of course it is. Then, then we get to go to another level, and we say, this is a picture of this kid in a bikini. Is that okay to post on Instagram? And the kid, the older kids almost always say no. And they talk about reputation. So we do get them to try to think about what's okay and not okay to post. The immediate risk is stranger danger. That's what comes to mind. Commonly, the more common risk is Don is hitting his reputation management danger. And that's, that's what we think, see through images on Instagram. We just get the kids to think about what they're posting and what message they're sending. Usually they're pretty good about it. Yeah, it, you know, when you're talking about what other kids do, you'd be surprised how Victorian these kids are. Very concerned. I mean, extremely. Very concerned. Now, what they choose to do themselves may be a totally different story. Right. You know, and in fact, uh, there was a research study done in 2008. Now, they haven't completed another survey to follow up since 2008, but it was an interesting one. It said, um, they did a study on uh, students that had contact with online predators. How did the contact, how was it facilitated? And in 100% Wait, of are the, you ready for this? Get ready for this one. In 100% of the respondents, the child made first contact with the predator. In that predator did not make contact with the child. In that, now, that was a 2008 study. They haven't done it since. But I'm willing to guess that there's a lot of risk-taking behavior that happens on the internet. A lot of that has to do with that amygdala just not doing its job properly online. Because let's face it, you're in the privacy of your own home and your own bedroom. What bad can happen to you there? The amygdala does light up, but then the hippocampus pops in and says, oh, calm down. I know what this is. If you're in your own home, everything's fine. And then they do some behaviors that probably aren't very safe. This is, anybody know that one? Mm -hmm. What is that one? Snapchat. This is with a bullet that's rising with um, Instagram. Now, the way Snapchat works, predominantly, it's actually social media. It's just like any other social media site. But what it's known for is you take a picture and then you can send it to someone. And then you can choose how long they can view that photograph before it disappears. So you have one to 10 seconds to look at that photo once you receive it, and then it disappears. Now, a lot of kids think that that's a safe way of transmitting inappropriate pictures without them being able to be safe, but that's kind of erroneous because we all know, well, kids know, that if you screenshot the screen and take a picture of it, then you can save that image and it's good. Yes. And where are the new update? Um, it's horrible for exactly it? what you're talking about. You yeah. no longer have to hold your finger on the picture to keep viewing it, which always made screenshotting hard yeah. for the kids. So you just tap it, and it stays up for the timer length. And I, I don't know if this is true, but I would, I've been told by kids that you can save the picture now. Like there's, a, there's an option to save Actually, the picture. Actually, yes, there is, yeah. uh, there is an option to save the picture. Um, and there's not much the sender can really do. Yeah. But there's also... Um, kind of this thing built into their program. If you do save somebody's photograph, they're at least alerted, hey, they saved your photograph. Unless they use one of the, um, one of the sneakier apps. Uh, if you're using something like uh, Spy Snap or Snap Pack, what that is actually created to do is that if someone sends you a Snapchat photo, you can open it with the assistance of Spy Snap or Snap Pack you can save that photo very easily, and the sender doesn't know that it happened. So here's the recipe. Impulsive teen or tween wants attention, puts an image out there from just um, silly to illegal that they want to make go away, send it thinking that's going to disappear in eight seconds, and at least if somebody does a screenshot of it, I'm going to be notified, boom, and it goes out there, and they open it in a hack, and then it's gone. A lot of times um, when I overhear the calls this guy gets, if we're driving somewhere, and it's a, a, an inappropriate image you call, almost always it involves this meeting right here, this now, platform. 
The interesting thing to know about this is that any image that you create with your phone, it never leaves the phone. It's always there. It never disappears. You and when you receive you it, it doesn't go away. Right. When you receive that, away. well, think of it like this. When you delete something off of your phone or your computer, it's like a plug. Okay, let's say you have a plug. It's this thick. And it's so big, you need what in the back of it to find things? Index. Okay? Think of it this way. It's like taking that little spot of the index and ripping it out and throwing it away. The contents of the book is still there. It's just how to find it is missing. Now, as a forensics investigator, you can find it very easily. You know, even if someone corrupts the information, you can rebuild it and view what it is. Nothing goes away. Now, if you use um, like Apple products, you have an iPhone, a lot of times every single image that your student actually creates gets uploaded to the iCloud if you have enough space and it's set up to do that. Sometimes people choose not to save things to the iCloud, but in most cases it's just by default it's going to do that. They may not even know it's happening. So as a parent, it always behooves you to kind of look in that iCloud just to see what's stored there, see what kind of pictures there are, because that kind of gives you an idea of what the kids are actually doing. Um, now, phone apps to be aware of, keep in mind, the phone that you give your child is a device, it's a tool, just like anything, it can be customized. When you give it to them, it does talk, it does text, it takes pictures, videos, so it still does a lot. But then they can customize it to do a lot more, can't they? You know? These are the ones that we're kind of concerned about. Snapchat, obviously, because there's this false sense of security. I take a picture, and in 10 seconds, it will be gone. There have been cases in Franklin County and beyond where someone may coerce someone to take an inappropriate picture and send it to them through Snapchat because it's safe. Then the recipient saves that image without that person knowing it, and the next thing you know, it's all across school. Um, that's happened multiple times. So this is just one of those things we're concerned about. Um, on a positive note, Snapchat is not broadcast. Okay, Facebook, Twitter, it's broadcast to a large group of people. Snapchat's only sent person to person. So on that note, Snapchat is good because it isn't broadcasting generally. It is, uh, it is a narrow focus cast. So there are some good things to it. Uh, Kick. How many of you have heard of Kick? I have a question back to Snapchat. Is there yeah. any way for parents, I mean, the same way like your kids are on Facebook, crowd, and monitoring? <laughs> like, is there a way to monitor, though, the Snapchat? Like, can be the, the parents that are going on there and they're like, they have to click you in order to get that picture? Best thing for you to do is to have their password so you can get into it. I'll be honest with you. When, your kids should never have a password that you don't know. It's like them putting a, a lock on their bedroom door and not allowing you access. That's the easiest and most direct way. Plus, if we have an investigation we're working, let's say your child goes missing, being able to get into their account and figure out what happened, what they were doing, who they were talking to, that's, that's a lot of power. That's, that's useful. That can save us two hours. When you're looking for your kid, an extra two hours can mean a big difference. Um, so Kick is uh, an instant messaging app. Basically, it text messages, takes pictures, videos, that kind of stuff. And it's a little, uh, it's like a, a little online community too. Now, the problem with Kick is this. A lot of parents will check the text messages on the phone. If they don't see anything unusual, they think everything's fine. Unfortunately, a lot of kids are doing their text messaging through Kick or other types of apps like Kik because they're using text messaging to interact with each other. Um, and it's not uncommon for us, this is another one of those benchmark questions we ask. We ask kids, how many of you have KIC? And hands go up, and then we are like, of the people that have KIC, how many of you have ever been messaged by someone you don't even know? You'd be surprised how many hands go up. It, it concerns me how the kids shrug it off and say, no big deal. I just ignore it. 
mean, that really concerns me. To me, it's a big deal. To Don, it's a big deal. To the kids we talk to, they're like, ah, eh, they're just creepy. I just don't talk to them. I'm like, whoa. How does that even happen? How are they, like, how are they, how are they found? You, you, there's a search function that they can use. They, they can find the you. GPS. You know, and a lot of times, a lot of times, kids put their stuff out there. How many of you would be surprised to know that kids will solicit adults to talk with, but they don't know? Um, but it does happen. Um, now, Omegle is another one that to be concerned about. Omegle is actually a, a video chat. Um, program and what it is is it allows you to video chat people. Um, Tim loves this tagline they have. Yeah, look at their tagline. It doesn't even pretend to be something that it's not, right? And so not only is it talk to strangers, but um, share uh, images of each other in real time, right? Now, strangers. Here's the real concern about this what a lot of kids use Omegle for, and this is really something that concerns a lot of young students because kids have been traumatized just by popping up to see what this is. We've had kids stand up in parent presentations and say, parents, you really have to listen. This is a bad website for kids to be on. What they use it for is um, a place to meet up and do things that are sexually oriented. So there's the kids or the adults? Kids. Kid to kid, kid to adult. And the kid thinks they're uh, sharing these images with another kid because they're looking at image, they're looking at um, another clip and think that's the person. And then the person will come on as themselves. It is possible like, oh, to take a video clip, strip it from the internet, and play it so that it plays through Omegle and allows the kid to think they're talking to another kid. And it could be a grown adult. And the receiver of that is um, capturing that image off of their own computer screen and archiving it and uploading it somewhere else. Does that make sense? So they're taking a movie screen of the screen they're watching. They're taking a movie of their screen that shows the other kid. And now I've got you doing this. And now, I'm throw it out. this has never happened, that, to my knowledge, on Omegle. This has happened on other face-to-face -face web webcam sites. But this is a one in a million. I've had, heard it happen once. Don't take it with a grain of salt, but it, it can happen. But there's another website that has a video chat uh, service. It's also linked up with something called PayPal, where you can send and receive money. And what we had found out is that some parent, a, a, a mother and a father called us up and said, hey, you know, my daughter seems to have a lot of money. We don't know where it's coming from. What she was doing is she was going on one of these websites and soliciting people to watch a live cast of her doing very sexually explicit stuff. Basically, she'd do whatever they tell her to do. And what she would do is she would wait till people deposited enough money in her PayPal account, and once she reached a certain dollar amount, the show started for whomever paid the fee. So she was doing this three days a week, and she was making $500 a night, she was making $1,500 a week. So when we're talking about the ability to broadcast information, now we're talking about the ability to live cast information from your home, from your room, in high definition. Those are the apps that are available free to be able to do that. Uh, could you broadcast some cool stuff? Absolutely. Could you broadcast some stuff you later regret? Oh, absolutely. So, like I said, how to use it. That's an outlier. That normally doesn't happen with kids, but they do some pretty distasteful things on, on this website. Um, Whisper is another one. Whisper is like Yik Yak. Whisper and Yik Yak are kind of rumor sites where you can spread rumors about people, but you can do it anonymously. And it allows you to say things that you wouldn't normally say to someone's face. Like, um, you know, Dr. Tim watches cartoons on Saturday morning. You know, I wouldn't say that face to face, but on Whisper or Yik Yak, I might spread that to the world. You know, so these are some pretty uh, it was intended things. to be a place where people just 
bared their soul and felt better afterwards. We, we know that's not a good thing to do, but that's what it was intended to do anyways, and it's become something that Don shares my secrets, not I share my own secrets anonymously. That's the problem. Now, and what did Yik Yak do? <laughs> Yik Yak, professors hate this, and it's what happens is you get some young, smart guy like that guy back there, right? He's, he's a graduate assistant in my class, right? And I'm teaching, and he's got Yik Yak open. Yik Yak is um, meant to be broadcast only to the college community that you're in. And they're broadcasting rumors about me and commenting about me while I'm talking. And he comes up, which is how this happens, says, hey, I need to talk to you about something. One of the kids in here had said this, this, and this about you. Let's broadcast this. So higher ed is caught because they're like, freedom of expression. You know, <laughs> unless it's about me, right? And so what's happened is the high school kids thought, hmm, let's use Yik Yak and let's broadcast stuff out of high schools to the point where it became a real security problem. And so Yik Yaks agreed to build supposedly geofences so that the kids cannot broadcast out of Phoenix Middle School or Thomas Worthington High School or Kilbourne. But they can out of Otterbein College or Capo. And it's a rumor mill and it's meant to be. I can't think of a great reason for that to be on your kids' devices. That's why we put it on here. Um, what's your worst nightmare as a parent? Right? So we'll show you some of these, and then we've got some other ones for you. All right, the first is, Don said, don't play with fire. I don't know if you remember that little thread. Let me thread it into the digital aid for you. There's a thing that's called a fire challenge, where kids would set themselves different parts of their body on fire and then record it. Where do you think these are usually posted? On that innocuous site that everybody thinks is not a big deal called YouTube. And somebody sees it and says, maybe I can light this much of my body on fire. Maybe I can light this much. So it's a fire challenge. Neck nominate is one where kids will um, make out with somebody and drink a certain amount of alcohol and then post it and then say, all right, Don, you do that now. You go home and grab your wife and yeah. you do. Oh, no, not going to happen tonight. Okay. But and then Don says, all right, challenge that dude back there, right? So that's okay, except they're too young to drink, and those are not posted online. There's a salt and ice challenge. Kids, uh, for a lot of reasons, like to self-harm. They'll cut, right? or they'll uh, rub erasers on and harm themselves so that they stop the circuitry that's keeping them feeling depressed, right? But the salt and ice challenge is putting salt and ice and burning different parts of your body and then filming it as you're burn, burning it. That's what that is. And then the Kylie Jenner challenge, which was popular a bit ago, where you try to inflate your lips through several different means and then send out images of you with inflated lips. So that's what this is. Now this is, see if you're linking back to what Don was talking about with Kick. You have a job to do, okay? Raise your hand when you think this kid shared too much on social media. Every time this child says something that you wish she didn't say, I want you to raise your hand. It's your only job. This is a YouTube, you go search it yourself after. This is a YouTube video where she's promoting her kick account. You with me? So that's what this is. And it's, we just found it. Not like an investigation. Hey guys, it's Alexis. Um, I look really white because I'm doing like this effect thing. Oh no, I'm normal colors. Okay. Anyways, um, like I'm changing the colors right now, like the little brightness or whatever. But anyways, I am new. But um, this video, I wanted to tell you that I have a kick. If you didn't see my other video that tells you that I have a kick, um, or I think it's a kick, a kick, kick, yeah, kick. Um, so if you need somebody to talk to, or you want to talk to me because I'm bored and I'm home alone with my kittens, so. If you need somebody to talk to or you're bored, uh, message me. My name is Alexis 
dot 69, 69. Okay, there's two 69s. Okay, you got that? You got that? Okay. So. It gets worse, but that's where we'll stop. You get, you get the idea. Now, what are the things that concern you the most? That she's even doing it. Okay, and she's broadcasting it to the whole world, isn't she? Right. Because this is on YouTube, right? Yep, for everyone to see. It's not blocked or anything. And comments are not disabled, by the way. So you can look at the comments that people are making about what she's doing. So what things did she say that you think could have put her at risk? Home alone. Home alone. Her name. So, bored. bored, home alone, yeah. So, it's not necessarily the tool that's bad, it's how people use it and the context. Now, it is true that 6,969 is her favorite number, but a lot of people might read into that. So what kind of person is she probably going to get? Yeah. So these are the concerns that we have. It's not necessarily the tools themselves, but how people use them. Um, that we really have to watch. And this is hard to catch. I mean, as it, as her parent, it would be hard to find this stuff. I'm sure the last thing she thought was that this is a teaching tool we could be using <laughs> on this evening at this time. I'm sure that's the last thing she thought that she created this. Even if she deleted it, it's ours now. It, there are two things we're concerned about. One is a live casting app that got squashed by another one that we're going to talk about, but it's still out there. You now, you simply connect to it via another account, social media account you already have, and it puts a little screen up, and it says go live, and you hit go live, and then boom, you're on. And you've got a hashtag that you can use. Hashtags are ways of organizing tables of contents to be able to organize whatever you're sharing. Anybody remember the old movie Wayne's World where those kids broadcast from their basement? Mm -hmm. This is this generation's version of Wayne's World. And they can, can I think of good things? Yes. Can it be bad? Who knows? So if your kid is using this right, this was an actual survey that I got a hold of, so you're going to see some data here. But what would you do if you found out your kid was using this live casting app? Would you unplug it, applaud their spirit, discuss the risks, or spin up your own channel right now? And here's how people respond. So that's what they do. I don't know what you do. Um, I don't know what I do. This one, did they use this one? Usually somebody, somebody fired one up in the last presentation we did and yeah, showed we, us. We were in a, another community just real close by, and we were talking about Periscope. It's, um, it, it's like a, a division of Twitter. And what it does is it's a live casting app. And when we were talking about it, one of the participants out there pulled it up and they said, yeah, just around the, around the corner there's someone uh, live casting right now. So not only does it show who's live casting and what they've titled it, but it shows your actual geolocation. Now, did you guys see the video of the girl driving drunk? She was you know, doing a periscope about her driving drunk, and it actually went on for quite a while, but the police were able to find her based upon um, so you get people it, watching it. She was an image and posting an image of herself driving drunk. I mean, she hit something and disabled her car. I mean, it was, it was pretty... Pretty graphic. It went on for about uh, um, 18 minutes. Here's here's a problem with this. At, at another parent presentation we were at, the administrator joined us for the presentation, and he talked about his experience with Periscope. And it can be a cool thing. Like his brother said, "Hey, you want to watch the girls playing soccer? I'll broadcast part of this to you on Periscope." His brother lives in California, so he did. He watched his nieces playing soccer. He goes, cool. I know what I'll do. I'll show him pictures of my girls jumping rope. So he hashtagged it, girls jumping rope. And all of a sudden, people he didn't know were jumping on to watch girls jumping rope. And they weren't, they're nobody he knew. And he so was like, anybody can watch on that. 
Yes. So he, um, that's our concern, is that everything technology gives us positively, there's always something else that can smack us on the back of the head if we're not careful with it. And yeah. so that's one of the things we want people to be aware of. <coughs> These are the ones we're just concerned about um, when kids use them with very little supervision. Um, very few of us would uh, give our kid a blowtorch and say, you know, have fun, and then shut the door and not watch them. Or, you know, power saw. It's the same thing with this stuff. They can be used responsibly, and it can be a great tool. Absolutely. But it does require a little more, you know, rolling up your sleeves and being involved in it somehow. Here's, because Here's a common thing. Digitally before, or before the parent talked when the kid said, hey, I want to spend the night at Johnny's house. I said, okay, here, remember, you're not to leave Johnny's house. If you want to come home, you call us, we'll come and get you. And that was the end, and no drugs or alcohol. Got it? Oh, God. Okay, fine. Now, you know what I add to the end of that? Do not tweet out of Johnny's house. Do not take images of people asleep at the sleepover and tweet it out. So, I mean, I do that. I build that in because some of the things that happen were things that are tweeted out from slumber parties. Right? So I have to build that into my parenting thing that my kid, he doesn't listen to me. Well, yeah, he listens, but uh, he doesn't like it. He just doesn't admit he listens. He doesn't admit that listens. wouldn't be cool. No, okay. All right, here's some parent monitoring stuff and then we'll get ready. All right, I need your help on this. The percent of parents, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, what would you say are the percent of parents who have taken away the phone or the internet? What, who would, what would you guess? 87. Okay, let's see. Don, what do you think? Close. That's 2015. <coughs> that was assembled and published from 2015. So that's pretty current data. I'd say I'd about agree with that. Okay, how many people have limited, which is a great parenting strategy, by the way, limit the time that the kids go online? Again, it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Just in your brain. What do you think? 50, 60, okay, thank you. All right, Don, what do you think? Yeah, 55%. Okay, here's the next one. Here's two takeaways we hope you take home. A lot of parents talk to kids about what to do online. They just don't say the two most important things. All right, so in your brain, what percent of parents do you think talk to kids about their online behavior, either the way they treat kids online or the way that they're accessing it and what they're sending? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. I don't know. You're gonna be surprised. <laughs> Only 6% of the people say never. Except they don't do this. They don't do the two most important things. They don't say, here's what you could be doing that's illegal. And the second thing that they don't do is they don't say, here's why this matters to you. They get that it matters to me when I say don't tweet out of the sleepover at Johnny's house. But what I should have said was, I do not want you sending out images that will um, harm your reputation. You know, the, there seems to always be two different types of parents that we run into on a regular basis. There is the one parent that is totally hands off. They let their kids do whatever they want. They don't really get involved in their online behaviors because they, they see that as kind of make believe, you know, no impact. Or you have the helicopter parent who wants to fight. Every single battle their kid has. 